Good afternoon, and welcome to the Fales Library. I'm Marvin Taylor. I'm the director. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the second of our Critical Topics uh, series for this year, Water, a Global Discussion of a Critical Topic. Um, over the past five, five and a half years, we've built a very large collection to support food studies uh, here at NYU and more generally here in New York. We've amassed uh, from zero to about 20,000 cookbooks uh, within that time. <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, and to greet Dahlia Carmel, one of our major donors who's here. Dahlia gave us some six, 8,000 cookbooks. We're nearly finished processing this amazing collection that she gave. Mm. And uh, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she just told me that she's uh, she's got more coming for us, so we're delighted. Mm -hmm. We're delighted about that. I'm getting older. <laughs> and when I first met Dahlia, she had books triple stacked on all the shelves. Everywhere you went, there were books stacked. I was afraid they were going to fall over on her. Actually, she said, "I have to get rid of them. I can't reach up anymore to get them off the shelves." And we can solve that problem. If any of you have it, we're very very happy to take uh, books and add them to the collection. Mm -hmm. um, the Food Studies collection here is, is truly amazing. It's not only people from the Food Studies department, however, who are using the collection. Uh, since we built that collection, we're seeing students from performance studies, from English, from a whole, from history, from a whole variety of different parts of the university who are doing research uh, about food and food ways. So it's really become a vibrant part of what we do. Um, we've also been adding the archives of people uh, in New York were important for the changing American food waste post-World War II. And some of you may know this, but if you haven't heard this before, we were recently given James Beard's uh, papers. And so uh, we're really very delighted about that. And uh, some 26 cubic feet of, of materials related to Beard and to his contributions in creating American food and the understanding the importance of American food ways. Um, of course, this couldn't uh, be, uh, wouldn't be possible without Marian Nessel, who's a panelist today, who really founded the Food Studies program here and has been uh, the staunch supporter and, and sometimes a partner in crime in building the collections here, which are really uh, just going great guns. And of course, it couldn't be possible without Clark Wolf, who is the sponsor and ba the, the brain behind the critical topics in food series. So I'm going to sit down and introduce Clark. Uh, thank you very much. I, I do want to mention a, a, a bit about what Marvin has been saying. Uh, the fact that uh, Emily Gilder gave me a bag from Saks Fifth Avenue of James Beard's letters and photographs that I kept in a drawer for 19 years so that Marion could found a department so that uh, Marvin could develop the food studies program so that uh, 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 Cecily Brownstone's collection of books could come here to the library so that the University of Wyoming, who got the James Beard papers, because at that time there was no place to send them. So it was going to be a popular culture collection. They wrote a letter here to the library and said, we understand you have the major work from James Beard. We, they didn't know that it came in a sax bag. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would like to add our 26 cubic. It's, it's all of his papers. <laughs> I have to tell you that, that uh, this is, in part, a, a growing community collaboration. I mean, Dahlia's donation really inspired a lot of people. She inspires a lot of people. And a lot of it's smiling, too because we really care about these things. We're really passionate about it. And uh, in that time, people have begun to say, we want to give papers as well. Marion Burroughs just said she wants to have her papers here. Uh, Ruth Reichel gave us a tape of a conversation which she had with MFK Fisher. And Marvin, I believe at the last uh, uh, gathering, kind of asked her right there on the panel if she wouldn't like to give us the rest. We're talking. There are a lot of really wonderful things in process, and we are, we are delighted that these things are available to all of you who write and who do research and who do work in any, in any uh, real way. Uh, so if you have questions about that, don't hesitate. Um, we're going to be doing a couple more things this year. In October, October 16th, we're going to be talking about emerging and vanishing immigrant foodways. This is a moment where immigration and cross-cultural collaboration and explosion is m more viable, more interesting, more vibrant. The discussions start with, oh, you know, I can't find a good knish, which is often the way my conversations start, right? Uh, <laughs> but it was also uh, uh, wise for us to think about the fact that it's, it, it's time to look at what's being added to our table. Um, so that's going to happen in October. Also, Tosca, you're going to have to help me. Hugh? Fearly, Fearly Whittingstall, anybody? No? Hmm. Cottage Inn Meat Book, Cottage Inn Cookbook, England, a major farmer, 
right from the farm, uh, nose to tail pig farmer, you know, he loves all that stuff, is going to join us in October. Um, and we're going to probably talk about pork. Now, we will be done before Kol Nidre services start that <laughs> night. All cultures come here in New York, right? Yeah, we're all together here. Right? And then next year we're going to, yeah, it t just turned out that way. Uh, and then next year uh, we're going to talk about the importance of food and feast in all cultures. We're going to talk next June with Gus Schumacher, who is giving us his family farming histories, photographs, and daily journals that come from 72nd Street on the west side and then Flushing, Queens, 100 years ago. We're going to begin to collect those things. Um, and then in the fall, there's another one that I, I can't remember. And maybe Tosca will at some point. By the way, those of you who get emails from somebody, that's Tosca. She's the one you can thank. Yes, let's, get, let's hear it from me. All right, so today, I have been told that, that this is a very challenging subject. I think it's true that there are a lot of things about which we want to know everything, and there are some things we just don't want to think about. And as Americans, that list sometimes can get kind of long. However, earlier this week, we were all reading that Spain is having a drought. Well, you know, not exactly a surprise. And that um, California announced yet another drought only this morning. Um, and that's the good news, because those places kind of know how to deal with this stuff. Water is the basis of our lives, I mean, a lot of our bodies, but it's also something that's been um, coming and going, and as a metaphor, and as a symbol, and as a piece of business, and as uh, the other element to terroir, and uh, in fact, to the extent that at one point, and one of our panels is going to talk about this, here in New York we had a water sommelier. It has been a, a symbol of, of gastronomy, or sophistication, or connoisseurship. But it's also, many years uh, in every culture, been a symbol of success and prosperity and safety. Water is under siege. And without it, we're kind of over. Dried so up. Dried up, thank you. <laughs> so today, we have an extraordinary group of people, uh, many of whom you know, all of whom you know. I'm going to introduce them quickly, and then we're going to start the conversation. In front of you, you have a little bibliography that we thought you might enjoy. You also have a 3 by 5 card. At any time, if you have a question, we're happy to ask it. Just write it down and pass it up, and Tosca will walk up and down and get those fr from you. And then afterwards, I want to mention that we will be having a reception in the gallery. Marvin and uh, the Fails always has an extraordinary exhibit in the gallery. I urge you to come and see what they're doing next and to really take a look at it. We always now have foods from our farmer's market from yesterday. We always go to Union Square now. Instead of sp spending uh, our donation dollars on things that are wonderful and catered in, as New York often does. Tosca and I go on Wednesdays, sometimes with an intern, and we go shop. And there are three cheeses I've never had before from Hawthorne, Hawthorne Valley Farm. That used to, they used to make cheese on principle. And now it tastes good. You know about that, right? <laughs> right? Right? Have you been, right? It's a co-op, right? And uh, wonderful strawberries, a couple of strawberry cakes, a pound cake that makes you feel like you're at a very discreet wedding. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Gus Schumacher's brother-in-law has sent us several bottles of Vermont pure spring water, maple sugar, and milk sugar-based vodka. <laughs> you know, because we have to, I don't know, dance a little bit in the afternoon. <laughs> um, but there'll, there'll be some things there for you. So let's begin. Maureen Clancy was, for 25 years, the food editor of the San Diego Union Tribune, as well as its restaurant critic, under various names, some of them hers. Um, when, when she retired from that, of course, Maureen had much more to talk about and now has a wonderful website called MaureenClancy.com. Uh, it was partly because of something she wrote in the Union Tribune that made me think about today, because she wrote a piece uh, about what I'm now refer referring to as Alice Water, right? <laughs> Tap water? No. Right? Al uh, terrible. All right. About how, about a year and a half ago, everybody was buying all kinds of bottled water, and Alice kind of said, oh, you know, that may not be a good idea. And everybody went, oh, you're right. OK, Alice, yeah. And she was right. Not the first, but a voice we definitely listen to. So please welcome Maureen Clancy. <laughs> Next to Maureen is a New Yorker. You can tell by the black chef's outfit, <laughs> who is currently living in the middle of a desert. It's called Las Vegas. Rick Moonen is certainly one of the best fish cooks in the world and certainly one of the first and most forceful and most successful uh, uh, advocates of thoughtful practices for seafood and the world's waters. Please welcome Rick Moonen. 
Alex Prudhomme uh, wrote a book with his aunt Julia, and it's kind of good, <laughs> right? Well, Alex's next book, uh, a after that wonderful book with Julia T Child, um, is about water. And so we thought we'd get him mid-process, because this is, after all, a reference library. And we're hoping that he'll refer to your questions in his next book. Please welcome Alex Prudhomme. And actually, the, the person who uh, uh, gave me what I need to say when people say to me, what do you think about bottled water, uh, is actually our friend and colleague and uh, uh, the person who founded the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health, as it now exists, in her wonderful book, What to Eat, which is now out in paperback, thank you very much, next time we'll have it out front, <laughs> uh, has a wonderful section that uh, she actually got a lot of requests to read when she was going around the country in the first and second tour about this wonderful book, What to Eat, a, book, uh, a section about water, about bottled water, because people asked her all the time, you're the scientist who knows mo more about nutrition than anybody. Should we be drinking eight glasses a day? And you know, how do you feel about uh, that bottle? Please welcome Mary Nestle. <laughs> who proves that the airport still works. She got back from Denmark yesterday. OK, <laughs> we're going to begin with Maureen. Maureen, tell us a little bit, quick, short discussion <laughs> about that article you wrote about bottled water, why you wrote it, and what you saw happening when you wrote it. Well, I decided um, last year, the end of last summer, to do a story about bottled water and um, the talking about the continued popularity, the increasing popularity of it, and the increasingly dire statistics linked to it, like the 41 million barrels of oil that it takes in the course of a year to manufacture, ship, and refrigerate bottled water, or the three liters of water that are required to make one liter of bottled water, or the 30 million plastic bottles that end up in a landfill every single year. Uh, I had written a, a, a story several years earlier talking about the chicness, the Chanel holders for your bottle of water, how some communities, particularly big cities, people actually defined themselves by the choice of water that they would order in a restaurant. If they could come up with something that no one else knew about, then they were really hot stuff. So anyway, last year I decided to attack um, the, the largely um, imported bottled waters because that really bothered me. And, the, and at about the same time is when Alice decided that she would use purified Oakland water in her restaurants. <laughs> and she got all, because she had the, um, the capital to do it, she put in machines to both purify it and one to carbonate it. And I decided to ask in San Diego and see, first of all, I wanted to draw attention to these dire statistics with my readership. And I also wanted to see what San Diego restaurants were doing. Well, I found one San Diego, two San Diego restaurants who were using a wonderful company um, that is now doing gangbuster business, it was not at the time, called So Clear. It has a branch in, on the East Coast, I believe in Maine, and it has one branch out in California. And what they do is they produce a bottle with a very cleverly etched or colorful uh, logo on the bottle for a restaurant. They use a local source. We in San Diego have this mountain called Palomar Mountain. It has real spring water, I mean it's legitimate spring water coming out of it. So why were people getting water from Fiji, which was um, <laughs> 5,600 miles to California and another 3,000 miles to you folks here? So they, buy, they, have, they create the bottles, fill them at Palomar Mountain, deliver them to the restaurants. The restaurants use them. They pick them up every Friday, triple wash, sterilize, refill them with the bottled water, either flat or sparkling, back to the restaurants. Two restaurants in San Diego were using this. I thought this is a wonderful thing. Alice would love it. I did some research in LA. Couldn't find anybody doing anything like that in LA. And uh, then proceeded to ask some more San Diego restaurants. And I was greeted with a pretty shocking hostility. Yeah. Mm. These are fr a lot of these people I deal with all the time, and they were really hostile. How can you expect me to take an $8 bottle of water off of the menu and give free tap water? These are bottles that cost them $2. They put them on the menu for $8. It's obviously a huge um, revenue source. And several of them were really hostile, saying, you know, the restaurant business is hard enough. You can't ask us to do that. Sure, the environment is important, but business is more important. So um, in a nutshell, I've started checking recently to see what has happened. And actually, I have seen some of it happen by going out to dinner. S quite a few restaurants in San Diego are now using the So Clear. 
some restaurants have decided to um, to just get a filtration system and filter San Diego water, which actually does not taste good. <laughs> I, I, I can't fault people for getting some kind of um, tinkered with water, but some have d decided to do the filtration. Some are doing so clear. Some have taken bottled water off in favor of these. Many are still keeping bottled water and giving the customer the choice. <laughs> Um, one of the most amazing things last year when I did the story was a new restaurant, a super upscale restaurant called Addison, um, at that time had a, um, a water menu. Seven different waters that they very proudly handed to um, the customers, to the diners, and they could pick from seven waters. All the waters ran from about eight to twelve dollars a bottle. One was from New Zealand, and one was from um, ooh, someplace really wild and crazy. I can't remember. Anyway, and, um, and in checking on that this week, I have I discovered that the menu has been taken away. Yeah. And, um, and Clark mentioned the sommelier I also dealt with when I did the story a couple of years ago. Um, the Ritz-Carlton at Battery Park <coughs> was very, very proud of its sommelier and uh, water sommelier. And he was always tossing around words like acidity and finesse and these things that <laughs> pertain to water. He would go to the table and he would ask them what they were looking for. And the best one was a certain water that he recommended be paired with big chocolate cake. <laughs> I found out yesterday the sommelier at the Ritz Carlton Battery Park is not only no longer but nobody I talked to there could even remember him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've about summed it up. I've got lots more well, to say, but I will wait. We'll hold on to that. But, uh, thank you very much for giving us a little indication of what it's like to be on the front lines. Yeah. <laughs> All right, speaking of the front lines, this is a man who does not dance in the uh, spring waters in front of the Bellagio. Mm -hmm. He has a restaurant called RM Seafood. And, and Rick, tell us a little bit. You've got a wonderful book. Hold up the book. Come on, let's hold up the book. It's a wonderful book. All right. And what is it called, Rick? It's called Fish Without a Doubt. There you go. And the reason it's called that is for two reasons, I think, and I want you to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, number one, if you teach us how to cook something, I think it's going to be working out pretty well. <laughs> and number two, I also know that you really care about where your food comes from. And that's not an easy thing in the middle of the desert. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, tell us a little bit about the, your process, how you're dealing with it, what brought you to, to write that book, and, and what the heck we should know about this. But do it in about five minutes. Okay. No, no, no. We'll have plenty of time to talk. <laughs> Um, Fish Without a Doubt has been a, a, a project that I've been working on for four years, and I, I think it, the timing of its release is, uh, is, is perfect because although I've been uh, a, a staunch supporter of the environment for my entire career and a, an outspoken one for the past 12 when I joined Gibbs Swordfish a Break campaign 12 years ago, I think now is when people are starting to actually come to a realization that something needs to be done and be done now. Um, Chefs are gatekeepers, you know, and we're called gatekeepers. You know, we're, we're responsible for many things, many trends, and, 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 and sometimes that's great, and sometimes it's not so great. I mean, we had, uh, we've seen the popularization of certain species of fish and the demise of that very species of fish because of its popularization. And um, some of them are chef-driven. And um, one, one, a few examples are uh, pan black and redfish. You know, got very popular. Red Drum almost was drummed out of business. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think it was Julia Child that actually threw a monkfish on the table many, many years ago. Yeah. And this ugly beast, you know, and then the tail was delicious. And Gilbert Lacoste helped to take it to a whole new height. Yeah. And now it's endangered to the point of almost extinction. Monkfish. Um, as well as skate. Many things that we're not actually aware of um, yeah. are not doing as well as we perhaps may think they are. That was one of the things that drove me to do a book with a sustainability message in it. Um, what I wanted to do is to take the fear out of purchasing fish. How do, what do I do with it? How do I handle it? Wh how do I store it when I bring it home? How, how long is it going to last? Is it healthy for me? We all realize at this point in our lives that omega-3 fatty acids are fantastic for us. 60% of your brain is fat. Fat coming from a healthy source of seafood is fantastic for you. Why it's been called a brain food. Is that correct? No comment. Okay. <laughs> We're at a girl. <laughs> but it's good for your cardiovascular system. It's good, for your, it's good for your body. It's good for us. And realizing that, where do we go? It's such a confusion because the vernacular of fish alone 
it can be a, it could be an hour long discussion. You know, if I say the word rockfish, what does that mean to you? Well, on the east coast, it means striped bass. On the west coast, it means a fish that's decimated. You know, and it's several rockfish. Um, so what I try to do with fish, without a doubt, is to break it down into what, whatever the basics, so that we could take. For, and this is targeted for the home cook. Um, I, I, I created all these recipes on a very small stove in downtown New York City, in Alphabet City, with my co-author, Roy Finnamore, on regular, with regular pots and pans. And I, I said that if I can make these recipes in this kitchen, so can everyone else. And Gourmet Magazine just came out with a, with a cookbook club. Um, their first book that they selected is Fish Without a Doubt. And the reason is that Ruth Reichel, the editor-in-chief, was getting tired of books that were being... Um, released with well-known author names on them and the, and the recipes in them were just making people feel so they, they weren't good cooks because yeah. the recipes weren't working. Yeah. Well, she took the recipes from Fish Without a Doubt, handed them out to people in, in, in Gourmet Magazine that were not hired for their food expertise. They were hired as an IT person, a techie or whatever, and they came back and the recipes worked. And that was a testimony to actually, actually what we set out to do. That's nice. When you go to the store, you know you're going to be able to, if you have a, a recipe for chicken, you're pretty darn sure you're going to find chicken in the store. You know if you get a recipe for a steak, you're going to find steak in the store. If you have a recipe for halibut, you may not find it when you go to the store. What do I do now? With, in this book, I give a lot of different, uh, I, there's a lot of flexibility, accepting substitutes, because many, many different species of fish can work well. It's not just Chilean sea bass is the only thing, you know, because if that, if that is the only thing, and I don't know if you're aware, but it's, it's, it's overfished. It's pirated. The demand for it got so high that everybody was willing to go out and do whatever they had to do, legal or illegal, illegal in order to bring it into the marketplace. How do people in Las Vegas address seafood? Because, I mean, yeah. I was very careful to make sure that before we brought you there, and I did, I was involved, I, I will admit He's it. He's the reason. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. But uh, we didn't want to bring seafood there because people in Las Vegas were really, you know, thinking that seafood was that brown, crusty thing that came out fried and toasty that you put stuff all over, you know. And suddenly, in one minute, you brought good fish cooking. And then the next minute, suddenly we're all talking about the fact that there's no water, and they're building buildings all around you like crazy. And I mean, how does that how does that work? Well, I I get a lot of I try to get the fish on my menu at, at um, RMC Food in Las Vegas. I mean, everything on my menu is sustainable, you know, and, and I use a lot of different sources to to make that claim. And um, Wait, so everything is sustainable. How many items approximately? Or how many ingredients are you uh, seafood ingredients are you representing here? 15, Four? 15, no, about 15 all in all. You know, a lot of them are, you know, tilapia and catfish, you yeah. know, which I'd never That's, even worked with until yeah. I started out on this quest to do seafood for the masses, you know, bringing it to a level of, 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 of you know, understanding without a doubt, you know, right. and that does the name of the book. It's, yeah. It's without fear, really, but that, that's just not a good name for a book. So. That's right. <laughs> well, I don't know. Without, without fear is a great name. <laughs> I'd buy that book. Well, you shouldn't be afraid to cook food. I don't want, I didn't want to attach fear with cuisine so much, you know, because there's, there's enough things in this world that we have to worry about. And fish is just so confusing. It's such a, yeah. how do I know it's cooked? How, what about the fishy smell? And so I canvassed a lot of people to find out why are you afraid to cook yeah. fish at home? Yeah. Because most of the seafood that's consumed in the United States is consumed in restaurants, which is great. If everybody was coming to my restaurant, I wouldn't have wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and to go back on what you said in Las Vegas, um, you know, here I am holding the most perishable inventory in the world. Yeah. You know, in Sin City, you know, in the middle of the desert. So I try to get, I try to source it as close as I can. So a lot of the, a lot of the species are Pacific right. or farmed in the United States. Right. And w one of the things that strikes me about it is that if we are going to uh, be careful about the species that come from the, the waters of the world, then it, they should be special occasion. And they should be celebrated and they should be carefully done. There was a time when there was caviar on the bars in San Francisco because it was extra and there was plenty of it and it was salty and it got you drinking. Mm -hmm. This is not the late 1800s. You know, there was a time when oysters in New York City were so plentiful that it was throwaway food. That's over. We have to readjust how we think about seafood. And Chesapeake Bay was the, the most prolific estuary in the world for, yeah. for forever. Right until 50 years ago and we started to decimate it. I mean, it's really technology that has taken us to a level of decimation in the oceans. And it's technology and, 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 me, and a certain mentality that we're discussing today that allows us to do that with water and with a lot of other things as well.
All right. Well, Critical uh, topic. some of it, yeah, I was going to say some of it's bad news, but we're not done talking. And so uh, um, uh, what I want to do now is to go to Alex Ferdam, who's writing a book about water. And when we started talking about this, I, uh, it was very new for you. And I said to you, well, what is this book about, this book about water? And that was about six months ago, and we figured you'd know by now. So <laughs> 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 what is this book about, Alex? Let me tell you how the book began. Yeah. Um, I wrote, as Clark mentioned, um, a book with Julia Child. It was a memoir of the years that she lived in France um, in the 40s and 50s, uh, which were her favorite years of her life. Um, but when we were working on the book, we were in Santa Barbara, where she had retired to. And uh, we would sit around a little table in her living room, um, having a kind of free-flowing conversation. And we always had a bottle of water on the table. And it was usually French. And at one point, Julia said, now isn't it interesting that um, the French are so obsessed with water? And I said, yeah, why is that? She said, I don't know. I think it has to do with their digestive system. And I think they, they think water is medicinal. For me, it's just water. Um, and so I sort of started thinking about bottled water. Um, and uh, through a whole chain of events, um, decided that water is likely to become the defining resource of this century, at least as important as oil, if not more important. Um, there are a whole host of reasons for this, primarily uh, population growth, uh, the fact that we have a finite amount of fresh water, potable water, in the world um, that we're using at an incredible rate. Um, in this country, we're not that aware of it. We're very, very lucky. We can turn on the tap and have excellent water. In fact, New York City has some of the best water in the world. Yep. And I grew up in New York City. I never thought about it, really. Um, I used to sit in my bathtub on the 15th floor uh, apartment that I grew up in thinking, now, how did it get from the mountains all the way up here? <laughs> but I never really thought about the quality of the water or the quantity of the water. Um, and um, so I start, uh, the book is about a whole series of subjects having to do with how we're thinking about water and how we're using water at this particular moment in history, because I feel like we're at a turning point right now. Um, there are other parts of the world, such as Darfur, where water is the root cause for outright conflict um, and war. And if you look at a place like Australia that has had terrible droughts, uh, or a place like China that has had uh, uh, terrible pollution, some of the worst water in the world, or places like Latin America, where uh, multinational mining companies come in and uh, strip mine and dump all the, uh, the toxic uh, tailings right into the streams, um, you begin to understand that some of our local issues are also global issues. Uh, we do really live in the global village now. And um, so I thought, hey, this is a great idea for an article. Um, it turns out that Julia's niece is married to a hydrogeologist. He's kind of an Indiana Jones of water. He goes around the world doing these amazing water projects. So he came for dinner one night, and we're sitting there drinking water and wine and talking, and he started regaling us with stories about his adventures in Indonesia and up in Alaska and down in, uh, in Peru. And I thought, wow, this isn't a book. I mean, this isn't a magazine article. This is a book. This is, this is really a phenomenal subject. So I was off and running. Um, most Americans. Uh, don't know much about their water. Uh, it always strikes me that if you're in California, which particularly LA or San Diego, uh, which are sort of artificial cities uh, built on water systems that extract water from hundreds of miles away, right. um, that you talk to John Q. Public and he does not have a clue about his water. He never thinks about it. Um, on the other hand, uh, as Clark mentioned, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger this morning announced officially that California is in a drought situation and that this was an emergency. And that sets into motion a whole series of, uh, of, uh, uh, of events that, that will restrict water use. Um, you talk to the water experts in California, though, and they're probably the most knowledgeable people anywhere. They really know their stuff. And they're very worried about water, both the water quality and water quantity. Um, now, most Americans also, when they think of water, they think of bottled water. Um, and so this was an obvious topic for me to look into. The problem is, as I was starting to do this book, bottled water, literally the week after um, I got a book deal with Scribner, um, 
bottled water started hitting the front page of every newspaper and the, the, the main feature well of every magazine that you open. Uh, there's been a tremendous um, surge in interest in bottled water in the last couple of years. A lot of the water bottlers are in a defensive crouch now. They're kind of in their bunkers. Um, they're, they're feeling put upon. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of rhetoric flying, uh, both pro and con. The bottled water producers um, will try to convince you that they're really doing no harm at all. Um, the anti-bottled water people uh, will try to convince you that, that bottled water is akin to trans fats or cigarettes. It's sort of the new evil uh, uh, consumer product that we have. Um, and I think my own journey through this subject is typical of most Americans. Um, I'm health conscious. I care about what I eat. Um, I drank a lot of bottled water for a while without really thinking about it. Uh, then I became uh, educated and sort of militant and refused to get bottled water and would always insist on having tap water at the restaurant. Then I began actually reporting and talking to the guys who are producing the bottled water and going to some places like Poland Spring, Maine or um, uh, various large and small water bottlers across the country. and. I now have a more nuanced view of bottled water, I think. I'm still, I mean, you're seeing me in the middle of, uh, of the process now. Uh, the book that I'm writing doesn't have a title yet, but it, it will hopefully be coming out in the fall of 2009. So you'll, you'll see then uh, my final conclusions. Um, and one of the things I thought would be interesting to do, uh, because there's been so much heated rhetoric on both sides of this debate, is instead of me taking a sort of strong editorial position, which has already been staked out, um, I would tell the story of contemporary American bottled water in the voices of those who are actually doing it. So I'm creating an oral history of bottled water as told by the water bottlers and some of their critics. Um, and it's been fascinating. So I begin in 1977 when a couple of guys um, who didn't know too much um, hooked up with a French entrepreneur and brought Perrier over. Uh, and they brought it to New York. They started sponsoring the New York Marathon. Uh, it became a kind of a chic food stuff. Uh, it spawned some competitors. Um, and as you probably remember, in 1990, there was a great crisis when uh, benzene was discovered in Perrier, and there was a worldwide recall. Um, the company didn't handle it all that well because they weren't very savvy about you know, how these things work. And so uh, they lost a lot of market share. Um, and some would argue that they still haven't bounced back uh, from that even now. Um, it opened the door for brands like Evian to step in. Um, and the water bottle industry has shifted dramatically. When, um, when the um, entrepreneurs who brought Perrier over um, we're starting to talk about this in the 70s. They, they, um, they asked McKinsey, the consulting firm, to do a, do a study on, on the potential for a bottled water market. And McKinsey basically said, don't bother. Go away. There's no market for bottled water in this country. Uh, <laughs> people like soda or beer, and, and uh, you know, why would they want to pay for water? And uh, even these entrepreneurs themselves sort of thought to themselves, you know, yeah, bottled water, what, what is that? Uh, because we, we didn't really have a, a modern version of bottled water. We, we, in the 19th century, America had quite a vibrant uh, bottled water business, but uh, after chlorination came into play in municipal water supplies, uh, the bottled water market basically uh, collapsed. Uh, but uh, Gustave Levin, who was the French uh, head of Perrier, had a vision. He said, you know, I just paid all this money for this McKinsey report, but I don't believe it. Uh, and he sort of rammed this idea through. And these guys helped him to market it. And it was a slow start, uh, but they gained momentum. And you know, now it's like a $10 billion a year business uh, uh, nationally. Uh, we drink a tremendous amount of bottled water. Um, uh, so it's, been, it's, been, it's very interesting to see this business. I mean, that's a pretty rapid uh, rise from basically zero to $10 billion. Uh, since 1977. Well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the arc that you're experiencing uh, will mirror in some ways the arc that we're experiencing as well. I, I'm, I'm really glad that you're out there being this everyman on our behalf. I live when I'm not in New York City in Tribeca in a hundred-year-old cabin in the woods by the Russian River. 
and it's in an area that has traditionally uh, known plenty of floods. Mm -hmm. this, in, 19, in 2006, it flooded, and everybody was fine because after a, about a two-decade period of raising the houses, we kind of finally accepted in wine country and farm country that floods are supposed to happen when there are rivers, and that's why the earth is rich, and that's why this all works. And the town of Napa and the town of San Anselmo, very fancy Tony towns, flooded for millions and millions and millions of dollars because they thought water was something that arrives in a bottle, you know, or in the tap or in the 16th floor tub uh, <laughs> somewhere in San Francisco. So this conversation is timely. Obviously, it's timely. And I, I, I think you hear some of the different voices, uh, uh, the, the journalist, the chef, the, the writer and researcher. Um, so now we're going to talk to uh, the boss. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, yeah. <clears throat> because, I mean, in all of this, we are given, I mean, for me, Perrier was the first I ever learned about imported, really fancy, long-lasting bud vases. Do you remember that? How many of you were a waiter in the 70s or the 80s, right? right? It was a bud vase because you drank that stuff really fast because it was, the, the, the bubbles hurt. You know, San Pellegrino was such a relief, right? And, and, and then you find out that the French only drink it as an aperitif, too. You know, they don't do that all through the evening because it doesn't go so well with a burger. But anyway... Um, Marion Nestle actually studies what we eat and what we should eat and what we might eat and what it might do to us. Um, and that's a good idea. And since water is so fundamental, as you've heard these things, uh, I've asked Marion to kind of give us a, a, an overview as a scientist and as somebody who helps translate for us the world we live in into the uh, table that we try to visit on a regular basis. So Marion, help us out of this. Well, this is totally simple. Um, the <laughs> physiology of it is simple. We need two quarts a day, and that's to make up for um, sweating for the amount that you pee out and excrete um, as part of metabolism and all the other things. So that's two quarts a day. It's about eight glasses. But that doesn't mean that you're supposed to drink gl eight ounces, eight glasses of water a day, because there's most of food is water. Even meat is 40 or 50 percent water. Um, and coffee counts, tea counts, vodka counts, wine <laughs> counts. You pee. Um, everything counts. And um, the whole business about eight glasses, there's absolutely no evidence to back it up at all at all, and Center for Science and the Public Interest just this month has published its lead article on it, and they interview a kidney specialist who says he kept trying to track the research that said you had to drink eight ounces of, or eight glasses of water a day, and he's never been able to find it. He thinks it's marketing hype. I think it's marketing hype, too. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments about it. Water is one of the most fundamental public health measures that we have, and it's it's kind of an index of a functioning society to have a public water supply yeah. that works. I mean, the critical uh, example of how public health started was the pump in London where if you used it, you got cholera from the drinking water, and if you didn't use it, you didn't, and that was the beginning of epidemiology. And we judge the functioning of societies today uh, from a public health standpoint on whether they have a decent water supply or not. If they don't have a decent water supply, you know that kids are going to be sick and dying at very young ages. You know that mortality rates are going to be very low, and the people are going to have all kinds of diseases that people in countries with decent water supplies have. It's very easy to have a decent water supply. You just have to do it. Um, so the fact that some countries do it and some countries don't gets water into the uh, realm of politics almost immediately. And my area of research is food politics, and there's plenty of politics when it comes to food. Um, <clears throat> and, I, I, and I just want to say a couple of things about it. First of all, it's bottled water has been around for a long time. If you live in New York, didn't everybody you know drink seltzer yeah. and have it delivered to the house? Yeah. Um, in fact, in my building, people are still having mm -hmm. seltzer delivered. Um, if you want to know about the politics of water on the West Coast, you go see Chinatown, the yep. movie, yep. a very excellent example of, of, of what that was about. But now water is a commodity, and it's a commodity in the same way so many other things are. Um, and I believe that part of the eight glasses of water a day comes from uh, water companies that are marketing and want you to drink more of it, not less. Um, and the consequences of bottled water have had an enormous 
um, effect on the on social our social contract, if you put it, because it shifted uh, what we used to do in public health to something that's now privatized, something that used to be free and a mark of what societies did for their people is now totally private. Kids in school have to buy bottled water because the drinking fountains don't work, and nobody thinks to clean them. Everybody thinks the water supply is lousy, and a great deal of marketing effort goes into making you think that the public water supplies aren't any good. Uh, certainly in New York, the one is okay. And I know lots of people who won't drink New York water because they're afraid of it. Um, and this has had just, an, uh, I think, a really bad effect on the social contract where um, People are no longer putting pressure on government to make sure the water supply is okay, to test for contaminants and toxins. Um, the governments don't care. Everybody drinks bottled water anyway. Um, and, I, and I think this is just an enormous issue that m means that it's something we really need to be working on. I want to tell my own uh, water sommelier sto story, okay. if I may. Um, <laughs> because I loved it. I was in Dubai on a family trip, uh, and we went to Wait, 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 on a family trip? On a family I mean, trip, come on, because that's my, part good. You know, my partner... Thanksgiving in Dubai, uh, Mary and Nestle, you know, that's what you do. Right? My partner's son flew for Air Emirates and lived there, so we went to visit the grandchildren. And we, we took the grandchildren one Sunday morning to brunch at the Birj Al Arab, which is that big hotel that looks like a spinnaker thing. Um, it's the most expensive lunch I've ever had in my life, but besides that, um, they uh, didn't serve water. You had to ask for it, and they brought a water menu. And they brought a wa water menu done in parchment. And they were mostly European waters. Um, they came, and each spring was described beautifully. One of the waters was organic. I don't know how they did that. Um, really? But the, but the astonishing was their pr the astonishing thing about it was their prices, because the cheapest one was twenty seven dollars a bottle, and it was a liter bottle. Well, f there are four liters to a gallon. Multiply twenty seven times four, um, and that's the price per gallon. Um, and you were paying more than $100 per gallon for water. Now, if this is an example of what's going to happen in, after climate change and after the price of food goes up, I think we're all in really, really serious trouble. Um, so we have with water, it is, in fact, the defining issue of the 21st century. Um, climate change and population growth are going to be taking care of that. It has an, it's going to have an enormous effect on food production because agriculture takes up by far the, mass, the vast majority of the water supply. Um, and the fact that we can't eat fish from local waters in New York State and in most states in the Union means that somebody's not minding the story. And I think we need to put a great deal of political pressure to try to do something about it. All right. So now I'm going to uh, ask you if you want to write some questions. We have some time. I'm going to start with some questions. So if you have questions and if you have a pen uh, or big lipstick, uh, please do. And Tosca will go up, uh, up and down and collect some questions. I'm going to begin by asking each of the panelists how they themselves might have altered their approach or their use of water in any part of their lives, whether it be the lawn, the hairdresser, you know, uh, um, um, or uh, I don't know, soaking dried fish uh, in their lives in the last couple of years. Maureen? In the last couple of years. Well, um, I have forced my kids. Closer to the mic. I've forced my kids in their 20s to refill their water bottles. Okay. We still buy Arrowhead because it is a very mobile society. Everybody is always constantly on the go. And p people need to carry water with them. And before I could get into the Nalgene-type bottles, yep. I decided, OK, we're going to have Crystal Geyser. I mean, we're going to have this arrowhead in a sports bottle so you can take it to all your games, and you can take it to your classes, but you do need to refill it. I got the, ew, mom, that is gross, and I don't want to <laughs> use someone else's bottle. I said, good. A big B on the bottle stands for Ben. A big N stands for Nicholas. <laughs> then one of them found something in the press that says, 
you, that you really shouldn't do that, that this is really bad for you. Now, maybe Marion has a, a, a handle on that, but I think it is the water companies, once again, marketing an illusion that you will get bacteria and get sick if you reuse your water bottle. So to my answer to that was rinse it with hot water and then fill it. And, it, and that has worked. And obviously, we've all, I do now try to carry one of these aluminum um, they claim Nalgene's bad for you too. I carry an aluminum bottle, and we're and basically I feel like I'm back eight years old when I used to ride my bike, pretend I was a Lone Ranger, and I had a canteen. Well, all right, all right. As long whatever keeps you young. This is a question, Marion. <laughs> Marion, this has come up a lot, and this is a good question. The dentist. You know, water. The dentist. Cavities. Adults. Bottled water. Fluoride. The fluoride. 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 Yeah. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supply fluoride into the, mm. into the water system in New York. I don't know mm. how to say it. Mm. I went to the dentist and I asked him, tell me, do you have a rise in cavities? Yes. And he said, that's Yes, what absolutely. He says, this is our society. Wow, yeah. mm. They pay taxes in order to get the fluoride in the water, and then they buy water in order to avoid drinking the tap water, mm. and then they come to me and I make the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Mary, it, it, is yes. this an issue? Yes, is, exactly. Right. I couldn't have said it better. It's not in all age groups that rise in cavities. It's in kids. Groups. It's not in it's not in the younger children. And the, and the they don't have any teeth. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. The American Dental Association says that they want us to have fluoride unless we're under two, but that you can get enough of it in toothpaste and in um, fluoride. Toothpaste. All right, uh, uh, we'll do that. And please write, write write it down for me. And and once again, we're talking about a tap water which is available to everyone and toothpaste for which you must spend money. So we'll get to that in a moment. New York water is pure, but what about the city pipes? What about them? You're worried about it. Get a breed of filter. There you go. All right. Um, okay. Uh, love that. Uh, this is one for Rick and for Alex. My local Whole Foods claims to sell artisan water, <laughs> handcrafted. I don't know. So is this. I mean, I mean, right, right. Whole, Art, Whole Foods, artisan water. Well, that's just, that's just. Using the stick for in, in, the, oh, right. in, the, in the microphone, uh, use the microphone. Right, right. Or organic but, but water. Let, but talk about those issues. Organic water, organic salmon. Right, I, I, the wine words, caught the words, French fries. The words that used to mean something to us obviously have been diluted to, to the point of, uh, of, of just a, it's a joke. I mean, the word organic when applied to, you know, fish is, is to me, a, I don't see where it could possibly apply because these are, they're trying to put it on farm fish. But when it comes to water, I mean, myself, what I've done in my own personal Tell life me. is I use, I use water filters. Yeah. You know, like anyone else. And I, I'm, I'm trying to do a, a distilled water um um, system in my restaurant in Las Vegas. I think that's going to make a huge difference. And using less water by looking at your plumbing and your waste uh, uh, removal, mm -hmm. and just making sure that you know you don't need. To, there's a lot more efficient ways about doing it now, and then you just have to look into doing it. Alex, what have you been doing? Well, if you come into my little office downtown in Tribeca, um, you'll look at the top of my bookshelf, and I have about 65 bottled waters. Each of one is different. Um, one of the things I've been doing is collecting bottled waters. And it cracks me up because the marketing is uh, really creative now. Um, you can buy a bottled water from Tibet called 5100, which indicates th that it's 50, it's, the water is from a Tibetan glacier 5100 meters uh, high, which is something like 16,000 feet. You can also buy a water from Hawaii called Kona Deep, which is actually taken from 3,000 feet down in the ocean where they suck the water up, they desalinate it, and they sell it for something like 8 or $9 a bottle. It's a premium. Uh, and then you've got everything in between, every kind of permutation, including um, bottled waters that um, Tibetan monks have chanted over that supposedly gives them a positive vibration. Um, I want that. And this only works for Sharon Stone. That's the only person. No. And then you can buy canine water, which is Bottled water for your dog. dog. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun collecting all these different kinds of waters. Um, I've been trying all the waters, and with very few exceptions, I really, I really don't see the difference. Um, there are a couple that do taste particularly good or bad, um, 
And I've been trying to decide whether to hold my own little water tasting for the book. I don't know. Maybe uh, I'll have to find that sommelier friend of yours. Um, but uh, it, it's, um, you know, it, it, when I was talking to the, um, the Perrier guys, they said, you know, the, the, the breakthrough for us was we realized that this isn't just uh, water we're selling. It's a beverage. And beverage was sort of the magic word with, um, you know, good well, harmony right, to it, and and it and it and it became like yeah. a fine wine, where there were these different grades, and that people had to know about it, and it was it, and it and it brought on this whole so, social cachet. Um, I was speaking to uh, Drew Naporn yesterday, uh, who runs uh, Tribeca Grill, a number of restaurants. Uh, I just met him on the street, and we were talking, and I said, "Hey, I'm coming to this thing at NYU," and. He's like, ah, oh, bottle of water, you know, what am I going to do? I can't not sell it, you know, it's so okay. great. You know, if people want to buy it, they're going to buy it. Um, uh, he's like, me, you know, I drink filtered tap water, you know, and, and, that, and that's, what I, that's what I drink. I drink, I have a Brita filter, and I, uh, and I drink filtered New York City tap water, and I've been told that that's probably the best you can do. Um, but the marketing of bottled water is, is a fascinating subject unto itself. I want to talk for a moment or two about the culture of it. The fact is that some of us in the 70s got excited by these imported waters and made us feel international and sophisticated and suave. <laughs> <laughs> and then Avion came along and we all felt like we were going to get, you know, musculature that looked like Madonna, which is kind of frightening. But anyway, you know. <laughs> no, Voss and, is hers. Well, but it's, it's, it wasn't wrong to feel connected to the rest of the world, you know. It wasn't wrong for us to see outside of our borders. It wasn't wrong for us to pay attention, in my opinion, to pay attention to being healthful and exercising and getting active. There's, it, for me, there were positive effects for all of this. The question is, uh, that's been posed, I think is really kind of great, is what's your response to bottled water projects like Ethos stole, sold at Starbucks? Stole, that's good. Sold at Starbucks. So how do, we, how do we address the cultural political dynamic of things that may teach us some good stuff, and may in fact be coupled with mar marketing hoo-hoo that gets us confused between New York tap water with a little fluoride in it and, you know, uh, $8 um, toothpaste now that does things and twirls out and it, there, uh, there's like a, there needs to be a toothpaste sommelier now. I mean, there's so <laughs> many, it, it, it's all marketing, marketing, but how do we evaluate these things? I would like to hear from everybody. Marian? I wrote about ethos in What to Eat um, because it had just come out and at that point there were analyses available of how much money would go to developing countries and how much money would go to Starbucks and it's no contest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean this is a way for Starbucks to make money. Okay, and anybody else? But having said that, I've talked to those ethos guys mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I went into it with some skepticism. Uh, but they pointed out to me, in, they started up in 2003 and since then, they've raised over $6 million for water charities. I, I don't know if you guys know the story, but Ethos, uh, e for every bottle of Ethos water you buy, um, they will donate five cents to a water charity, uh, usually in a third world country. And this was the whole business model. And they were a, a struggling startup for a long time. And then uh, Starbucks snapped them up. And, and now they're being uh, distributed by Pepsi all across the country. Um, their plan is to donate $10 million by 2010. Um, and so when I step back, I think, well, that's not all bad. Um, and I think it's, it's hard to fault them for taking a consumer product and at least turning it in the right direction and raising consciousness. So I, I'm not someone who, who I, I don't, you know. It, it's all fair. It's, this, is, this is good conversation. We have to have these kinds of conversations. I Ricky, uh, yeah, no. Maureen, Rick. Uh, right, well, my, my reaction to my that. My feeling is like oh, anything please. else, is, as long as we're taking <laughs> steps in the right direction, yeah. then, then we need to. You know, we could sit and argue and pontificate about the perfect way to do anything, and then nothing really gets done. So to see something that's being done in the right direction, I'm, 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 I'm for it. And then we talk about the nuance, something that might be done in a certain direction that might be helpful, and other things that might be critical that we better hurry up and do, right. have to be weighed against each other. Maureen. Well, I'd, I'm not a cynical person, but my feeling is basically they're still, they're just making money selling something that we really don't need, that we need to educate the population that we don't need that. I know that there are all these companies now coming up with, quote, serious initiatives to reduce carbon footprint. Fiji water 
says it's a portion of its profits go into forest preservation on Fiji, and Icelandic Water sends a little bit of money to African villages without sanitation facilities. Okay, the Fiji Water is still traveling 9,000 miles yeah. to get here, and Icelandic Water, my sense of direction is not great, but that's it's pretty far, far too. Yeah, but it's and melting and it's getting closer, so it's you, not a problem. You know what, if all of us in this room <laughs> switch to a, 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 a canteen, then we could send the money that we save each month on bottled water. We could send it to African villages that need sanitation. Or just your rates. rebate check. It's plenty. Right. No. So I'm, I'm a little cynical about it. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, there are a lot of issues, and they are intertwined. And obviously, uh, delicious and, and somewhat nutritious, or at least good for our bodies. Please, let's thank the panel. But I have more to say. I'm sure you do. <laughs> and, uh, and I know many of you have much more that you'd like to discuss. Uh, I would like to welcome and say hello to Judith Kilbride, the chairman of the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health, who uh, the last time I saw her last summer was uh, on her sabbatical in a farmer's market in Camden, Maine. So it's good to know that the department chair does, you know, walks the walk and eats the radishes. But speaking of which, please join us afterwards to talk more with these wonderful people. They also want to hear what you have to say. In the gallery around the corner, there really is maple vodka. There really is. There really is. And, and there are strawberries and some pound cake and a little cheese. Please join us. And thank you so much for coming.